change is on the horizon. All right, there are two acts that passed the legislature last year that are significant for this industry. We're going to talk about both of them. The first one is that one right there, Act number 2018-577, the tax lien sale bid down the interest rate. <clears throat> Basically what happened here is you had a group of revenue commissioners, legislators that got together, and they said, I mean, this is, again, this is my opinion, but they said, tell you what, we don't really like uh, these investors coming in. Uh, it's made life complicated for us. We want to simplify the, we want to, we want to, uh, pass a law that would provide for an alternate methodology for conducting a tax sale. As a matter of fact, it's not going to be called a tax sale. It's going to be called a tax lien sale. Whereas the old method is just called a tax sale. And that's because the verbiage under this methodology, as I think I said earlier today, talks about selling the land, and it is selling the land subject to the rights of redemption. This, this methodology, which that act provided for, sells only a lien on the land. And so you don't have a right of possession conveyed with this method, whereas you do have a right of possession conveyed with this method. <clears throat> So, the first difference is it's a tax lien sale. The second difference is how you win the bid at the tax lien sale. They still have an auction, but what happens is instead of bidding up the amount due, you bid down the interest rate. Some other states do this. Florida does this. I think Arizona does this. And basically what happens, uh, what will happen this year is the interest rate will start at 12% and people will bid down uh, until they get to zero. Obviously you can't go any lower than zero. So one of the issues that I have is how do you determine who gets it if you got more than one person willing to pay zero? We'll talk about that in just a minute. So basically this, uh, provides that you bid down the interest rate, um, the basic provisions, it's not a tax sale, but a tax lien sale. Uh, you don't bid the amount up, you bid the interest rate down. The following counties have committed to the tax lien sale in 2019. And if you look back at your, this page right here, you'll see the counties in gray, that are in gray blocks there, have committed to doing the tax lien sale. Now, there's a guy named Teddy Faust, who's a revenue commissioner of Baldwin County, and a guy named Don Armstrong, who's a revenue commissioner for Shelby County. These two guys were champions of this effort to get this legislation passed. <clears throat> and that's fine, whatever. But you also might want to know that these two counties are two of the, what, in my opinion, the top five counties in attracting corporate investors, okay? Um, so uh, Shelby County will actually be the first tax sale of the year in Alabama. It'll be April 2nd. Um, but all of these counties have committed to use the new method. If you wanna hear an interesting interview with Don Armstrong, Property Tax Commissioner Shelby County, um, go to uh, this website. By the way, this is the website that's also listed on the last page of this document right here. Right there, bottom of the page. Go to that website, go to tax sales, go to podcast. And uh, Denise Evans actually conducted an interview with him about 30 minutes long. It's very insightful as to how he thinks, number one, he talks about why they were for getting this passed, this act passed. And uh, he also talks about how he thinks it's going to uh, be executed and what he thinks the benefits are going to be. It's very interesting, and I would encourage you to, if you have interest, to go there because that sheds a lot of light on possibly how this new system can and will work. 
The first issue that raises my concern is uh, this one right here. Uh, and this is obviously, I took a picture of the exact uh, final signed uh, bill, uh, House Bill 354. Uh, if the interest rate bid for the property reaches 0% and more than one bidder remains, the tax collecting official shall draw lots <laughs> to determine the winning bidder for the property. Now, what century is this? I mean, that's what they used to do back in the Bible, you know. We want to draw lots to see who gets their head chopped off, you know, that kind of thing. I'm going, what in the world? Yeah, exactly. It's just a random flip in the coin. Uh, so whatever. Anyway, that's kind of amusing to me that that's, okay, we got such a good new system here, so advanced, and no, oh, yeah, if we can't decide, we're going to flip a coin. So, there you go. <laughs> Second issue raises concern is this. Um, the tax collecting official within 45 days after the tax lien auction date may sell at private sale an unsold tax lien for no less than all taxes, interest, penalties, cost fees. The purchaser at private sale shall be entitled to interest on the amount paid at the rate agreed by the tax collecting official not to exceed 12%. So what that means is if we have a tax lien sale and there's some that are not purchased, that it gives the tax collecting official uh, sole authority, may sell at private sale, um, any of these liens. Now, I have a question for you. All these people that are having, all these tax collecting officials, revenue commissioners that are having these sales, they may be great people. They may be pure as driven snow. I hope they are. Um, Anytime you give one person the sole authority to choose who they're going to sell something to, does that smell like a rat to anybody but me? Yeah. And then not only who to sell it to, but what percentage rate you're going to agree on? I mean, I'm sorry. I worked for Jefferson County where they just, you know, a few years ago sent all the county commissioners to the pokey <laughs> for a long time. So I'm kind of skeptical. So um, for the as you probably know, the sewer debacle in Jefferson County. But the principle is the same. You gave one or a small group of people a whole lot of authority to do something in an unaccountable fashion. Now, granted, this is not near as big a potatoes as the Jefferson County sewer situation, but this is an issue to me. In my opinion, it's an issue. Well, yeah. Yes, Brian? Here, we have a pressing question back here. Yeah. What is the <laughs> prison. In this case, federal prison. They were sent to federal prison. So, yes, sir. So this supersedes the sole state that we had last tax sales? Yes, this will this will be in lieu of a tax sale. This is the traditional tax sale that we've been talking about all day. Um this is the new thing that's going to happen in those counties that we referred to. So instead of being sold to state, the county is just going to hold them themselves? Yes. The county, what, what happens is the county can hold them for 45 days, or I'm sorry, the county can sell them themselves within 45 days after the auction date. If they don't sell them, then they're basically held by the county. Now, this person can come, the owner can come in and redeem at any time, but if that's not <coughs> redeemed, before the next tax sale, then they're added to the next tax sale. And they keep being offered the next year. So they just kind of keep piling up. It's sold to the county. Correct. Yes. Instead of being sold to state, it's basically sold to county. Yeah. So I better become good friends with that guy. <laughs> That's state. what I was just thinking on that. I mean, <laughs> see? I mean, where does that stop? Where does that stop? Exactly. Exactly. So, so is, is this mandatory or does each county It's optional. Decide? It's an optional method. And who makes the the tax collection official. Uh, guess, guess who? <laughs> tax collection official. Not the county commission, not the state, not a vote of the people. The tax collection official. Whoever that is. I think there are a lot of people are playing wait and see. I think they could move in that direction. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, we, we had some, and when I was at Jefferson County, we had some pretty good systems and we had some pretty good folks running the systems. And we had a hard time keeping up with stuff administratively. I'm not going to lie to you. I can't imagine 
what the complexity of this is going to require in terms of back office and just keeping up with stuff, especially when they still got to keep up with this stuff from years gone by. Plus, now they got to keep up with this. Oh, yeah, that's different. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. 2018, we did this. 2019, we did this. Oh, I'll remember that, okay? See, I mean, it's just, it's, unless you got a really good system and really good people running it, it's, it's going to create a lot of problems, in my opinion. Yes, ma'am. After the three years, does it still turn into a deed? No. It does not turn into a deed. However, you can foreclose on the property after three years if, if this lien has not been paid. Uh, now, I'm not sure exactly what that entitles you to. Uh, I think it probably gives you more rights at that point than a tax deed does, which is good. No judicial. What's that? No, no, no judicial foreclosure where you know wait the other three years. No, that's not a part of this this picture. Would yes, you sir. Suspect the, uh, that there's not as many corporations <laughs> at the Shelby County, Shelby and Baldwin County tax sale because they can't make as much. I would anticipate that there will not. I, I think some will come just to just to view it or to see what's happening. I don't think there'll be any. I may be wrong, but I don't think there'll be any uh, meaningful participation. I mean, you think about it. If I went to Shelby County last year and I bought a piece of property and I was able to invest, I mean, a nice piece of property, I was able to invest $50,000 excess bid on a property and maybe I could only make six or 8% out of it. And now I go and I can only invest $1,000, which is a tax amount due, and oh yeah, I got bid down to 3%, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'd much rather go to a county that's still doing this, load up and go to a different county, than play this little game. That's a waste of time, or it seemed to be. And you do say you can't take possession, so like you can't move around. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. You're just a, you're a, you're a, you're a lien holder in the purest sense of the word. That's, you just, you know, you're, you're like the IRS in that sense. You're just hanging your, you know, your claim on that property. And if they want to sell it or get a loan on it, they got to clear you off. But other than that, you don't have any rights to it. So in other words, uh, they've done away with the excess bids. They've done away with the sending it to the state. Yep. Are you still the, the highest lien holder? Um, no, it's, diff it's a different animal. Totally different animal than this one. Uh, like I say, you're just a you know you're just a regular lien holder like anybody else at that point. You don't carry any more weight. Yeah. See, tell me how that's anyway. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm prejudiced. I'm an investor. <coughs> I want to. Um, uh, I vote in favor of opportunities to let private money, private sector money, come in and help solve government disasters. Yes, ma'am. Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Okay. Yes, sir. From your understanding of all this, was this in an attempt to help the people who are delinquent? Or is this not to save line in their pocket, but some kind of potential issue? Like, what was the motivation behind this particular change other than getting rid of the investors? Well... Um, I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to color the water for you. But if you listen to the interview from Don Armstrong, he says a bunch of things which he thinks is happening. Here's what I really think is happening. I think the main motivation was to get rid of big investors. I think see what happens when the investors come and they put these big overbids. These elected officials have to answer to their constituents. All right, now think about the counties that are doing this. Shelby County, which has a lot, you know, let's face it, has a lot of high-end properties. Uh, you think Baldwin County has very many high-end properties? How about 100,000 condominiums on the beach? You know, if that's all it was, the answer is obviously yes. So you got the two counties with probably some of the highest-end properties in the state who, in my opinion, are probably tired of hearing from their constituents, and so they're... Uh, they're looking for ways to, to address that problem. And this is the way they've done it. And, you know, whatever. They, they did it the legal way. Um, here's what I think. I think they did it to get rid of big investors, which was their main objective all along. Um, when you bid down to zero, 
Uh, it basically becomes a lottery, you know, in terms of, oh, well, I wanted this one, you win the next one, whatever. Um, keep in mind, we're investing a lot less money than we were. So um, it's not going to be as attractive to anybody as an investor. Uh, it may result in more participation by local investors. You know, if I know about specific properties or say, hey, this property I know is abandoned, I'm going to go ahead and buy the one on this one. Yeah, that's a unique, that's, that's nothing that's going to be replicated as in a list. That's going to be onesies and twosies. So, yeah, it does give a leg up to, to the local people in that regard. Another concern, as I said earlier, gives a tax collection official sole discretion to sell remaining tax liens to whomever for whatever. So um, that's what I think about it. Um, I'm sure that there are people much nobler than I that feel differently, and that's fine. But, um, you know, you can't simultaneously remove uh, sanctions or remove punishment from people that don't comply and expect them to comply. I mean, that's human nature. I mean, try that with your kids, okay? How far is that going to go? All right. All right, that's all I've got about the uh, bid down or the tax lien sale. Anybody got any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Now, with the tax lien sale, with the other one, you know, you can give notice like the mortgage holder, you know, about a yep. year beforehand. Is that still even the case? <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think so because what's going to happen is uh, when you go to foreclose at the end of three years, if you've got this tax lien on the property and you go to foreclose, that mortgage company is going to be notified, and I'm sure they're going to have an opportunity to redeem at that point. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of a specific provision that they get a simultaneous, exclusive right to redeem, like is provided on that, on that part, on that side. Any other questions about the bid down? So what's really the point in doing the tax lien? What's why, the point in doing that? Doing the tax lien. Why do it? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, you mean, why do it as an investor? Yeah. Well, there's not much incentive to do as an investor. That's why I got number one right there. They want to get rid of big investors. And in the meantime, they're going to get rid of small investors too, I think. Are there any checks on this? I mean, what's to keep him from just selling to his good old boy partner here? Nothing. This is where it needs. We need an investment reporter here. <laughs> Nothing that I'm aware of. Um that was my concern. When I first read it, I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. This, this gives too much discretion to one guy or one lady even. Uh, this gives too much discretion to one person. Who is the person in Shelby County? The person's Don Armstrong. But isn't he leaving? Is he retiring? Oh, he may be. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter who the person is. It's that, that position is going to have a lot of unaccountable authority, in my opinion. I think the biggest problem here is that, is that the uh, delinquent property owner is not going to be incentivized to I agree. I think the unpaid are going to go up. I think they're going to go up. Because here's if, if we bid down this interest rate to 3% here, and I pay, okay, I'll buy this one for $1,000, and I bid it down to 3%. Guess how much the property owner has to pay when they come in and redeem? Not 12%, 3%. Okay, let's play this ball through. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a developer. I'm a developer. I've got this track of land in Shelby County, and I'm, I'm going to develop it, whether I'm putting a bunch of apartments or whatever. <clears throat> and maybe my property is worth $750,000. I don't know what the taxes would be on that. Let's say it's uh, $10,000. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of strapped for cash. You know, a lot of times developers are kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul and trying to make the deal work, and so they're not going to pay unless for something unless they have to. They're not going to come off cash to do it anyway. And they're trying to get deals going. They say, hmm, pay my taxes or not pay my taxes? $10,000, I really could use that for something else, do some excavation work. Um, uh, I think I'm, you know, over here, I might have somebody come up and put a big excess bid on it and then that really get popped. So I'm probably going to pay my taxes. Whereas over here, hey, it's going to go to the tax sale. The worst thing that can happen is it can sell for the amount of taxes due at 12%, but wouldn't it be great if I can get people in a bidding war over it and they bid it down to 1% or 0%? You see what's happening there? You see, I'm incentivized to get people to bid against my property. 
to run the interest rate down. How about I give you 50 bucks and you go run it, run it down, okay? How about that? And then you just pay my taxes and then I'll redeem it later, but I'd much rather you get 1% and 50 bucks on the table than somebody else buy it at 12%. You see, I mean, it's disincentive to do the right thing. Yes, ma'am. I know that sounds a bit crazy, but could you bid on your own property? Should I bid it down? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you probably could if you could get away with it. Uh, I think uh, they're going to probably try to determine if that's going on. But but logically, Is there anything in that says you can't. I'm not aware of it. I'm, I mean, uh, I'm not aware. There pro there probably is. But but you see, you're following the logic there. I mean, there's a disincentive to do the right thing. There's disincentive to take care of your business. Too fishy. What's that? Too fishy. Yeah, too fishy. Yeah, I agree. So what did you say about the right of redemption under this new act? Is it limited to three years? Well, it's limited to the tax collection official for three years. Then the tax lien holder can foreclose on the property. And I'm assume, and I don't know this for a fact, but I'm assuming that if you're going through the foreclosure process, and everybody's notified, they're going to have their opportunity to do a final redemption. I'm assuming that. I can't believe that. I mean, I'd be shocked if all it said, okay, three years out, all your rights to redeem are cut off. See you later. I mean, no. Use. I mean. Logic would tell you uh, that, hey, once they file a, a foreclosure action and everybody gets notified and somebody has an, an oh my goodness moment, then they're still going to have an opportunity to come to the table and redeem, to remove that lien, because it's just a lien. But should, what I, the way I see it is it's a lien, you're right, but yep. if the property already has a mortgage and the mortgage is bigger than the lien that you have on it, he got he can wipe you up, doesn't he? Well, mortgage holders. Well, are you talking about wiping me out over here? Yeah. You're not going to wipe me out. He's going to have to redeem me out. He's going to have to. Rec I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm talking about doing a regular redemption. See, once I buy this lien, it can still be redeemed through the tax of collection official. But you wouldn't get no interest off. A lot lower interest. What? I said you wouldn't get no interest on it. Correct. Like low bank correct. <coughs> That's correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, moving right along. Next act is uh, 2018 494 interest rate reduction. Lowers interest rate from 12% to 8%. Basic provisions. As of 1-1-2020, the interest rate will decrease from 12% to 8%. The second thing it does is it removes the requirement that costs for preservation must be repaid prior to redemption. I agree. So, um, the first provision is pretty straightforward. Uh, well, no, it's not. I'm sorry. Let's let's go back. Let's keep going. As far as I know, the following questions remain unanswered regarding this act. Does this take? Here's a question I have. Does this take effect going forward, or is it retro only, or is it is it retroactive? In other words, does it apply to tax certificates I have now, or only those that go to tax sale after one one twenty twenty? I think the fair thing would be twenty twenty. Well, the problem is. They don't care what you or I think, and they didn't make provision for that in the code. That's that's the problem. I mean, it's one thing I don't have to agree with it or not, but they should have made provision. Say, hey, it will be done this way. They didn't do that. If it takes effect going forward, does it just apply to parcels originally <coughs> sold in 2019, or does it also apply to subsequent taxes paid after 1 1 2020, but were, orig what were originally purchased before? In other words, if I bought one last year at 12% and then I try to pay a subsequent after 1 1 2020, am I going to earn 12% on the sub or only 8% on the sub? And who's going to keep up with that? You think the counties are going to keep up? Oh, yeah, Gary, you bought this one certificate and you get 12% for this year, but you get 8% for the years after that. I mean, they can't keep up with 12% straight through, much less or have a hard time. Um, so, anyway, it leaves more 
like somebody said one time, it scares up more snakes than we can kill. Um, so, you know, it creates a, a lot of issues. Back in January, a group of lawyers met to consider this new law and came up with at least four different ways to apply the interest rate change. I've got a friend who's an attorney, and he's on some panel of attorneys that meets to discuss what they believe uh, should be changes to laws to make them to solve problems like this. And they talked about this specific one, and they identified four different ways you could interpret that, none of which are provided for in the, the new statute. So how does both the other act and this one, how do either one of them benefit or help the county as far as revenue? Yep, it would be my opinion that neither one of them are helping the counties, uh, other than uh, arguably there could say that the um, bid down is simpler, and I would agree it probably is simpler to to administer. But <clears throat> uh, is that your job? I mean, is that the job of the of the uh, revenue commissioner or tax collection of, official? I thought their job was to collect the taxes. How about we start with that? It wasn't to be friends with all my constituents. It's to collect the taxes. It's to execute what the Constitution says my job is. So um, I think we have to ask ourselves, if, is that what this is doing, helping to collect the taxes in a more efficient way? Um, so you can be the judge of that. You know what, you know what I think? Yes, ma'am. I know the ones in red is the bid down. Yep. This new one here, does that go for all? It's everybody. Or everybody. It will affect everybody. So you'll still have the old tax sale methodology, which we've been talking about all day, but it will go from 12 to 8%. So is that going to attract more or less investors? Less. Less investors. Here's the thing that gets me. Here's the thing that gets me. All right, right now, whenever we have a tax sale, you have a certain number of properties. And when you have a tax sale, properties have to go one of two places. They're either sold to an investor, we used to call those individual sales, or they're sold to the state. That can be the only disposition of these properties. It has to be one of these. When property is sold to state, it's held by the state until one of two things happens. Either it's redeemed or it's sold to an investor like me or you. That's the only two things that can happen. Well, I guess the sale could be canceled for some reason, but 99% of the time, that's what happens. All right, when the property is um, redeemed here or sold here, the current interest rate is in effect. So right now, we're using 12% interest. When the property is redeemed down here, the property owner is paying 12% interest to the county, which divides that interest pro rata across all those tax districts that we saw this morning. So the school boards are getting 12% interest. The cities, the county, the state, the transit authority, the police Departments, they're all getting part of that 12% interest when the property is redeemed or when it's sold to an investor because we pay 12% interest to them when we buy from the state. <clears throat> so what this is doing is it's saying, no, we got too much money. We don't need that extra 4%. We're going to lower it to 8%. Who would like to uh, go and tell the school districts that they just voluntarily took a pay cut? Nobody ever asked that question that I'm aware of. Nobody ever went to police department or the, you know, sanitation department said, how would y'all like to have 4% less, less interest on the money that you get from tax sales? How many? Let's see the volunteers. See, nobody, I mean, where was the common sense on that? Um, so I, I never heard anybody address that issue. You know, all the, and regardless of how you feel about schools, public schools, private schools, whatever, uh, I think we could agree that public schools uh, would not contend that they need less money, okay? So um, anyway, that just kind of drives me crazy, sorry. Little 
little rant there, but uh, nobody ever asked that question because basically it's reducing the revenue. Uh, somebody asked a while ago, you asked, why, why is, it a, is any of this a good deal? How is it a good deal for the counties? It's not. It's not in terms of, it's not in terms of collecting more money or collecting it more efficiently. They're not going to answer to it going forward. I mean, we've covered that. But as far as the act of actually allowing this and being like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, who actually gave them the authority to change it? Well, when you say it was a, I mean, the legislature voted on it, so it was an act of the legislature. They are ultimately the ones who said, so the state yeah, I don't, I don't remember who sponsored the bill, who initiated the bill, but I mean, the Senate and the House passed yeah, it in the Senate. Which, which chicken needs to leave, leave the coop when we vote next? <laughs> <laughs> who do we need to well, vote? we would need to see um, who the sponsors are, would be the lead dogs on it, so to speak. Uh, but, I mean, the legislature passed it. So, um, anyway, it's, it's kind of it's disappointing. All this is from the state level? Yes. Coming down to counties? Yes. That's what I'm guessing. I'm kind of hoping that. I think um, I think that what's going to happen is we're going to see a decrease in revenue. I think we're going to see an increase in delinquencies. And I think, um, you know, hopefully somebody will wake up and smell the coffee and say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't have done those things that we just did and a few years ago, and we need to re-incentivize people to invest in these situations, um, take it really, I mean, honestly, it takes the burden off of, you know, the governmental sector, the, pri the public sector, because you're bringing in private money, given the, the private businesses are taking the risk. That's what, that's how business works. As you all know, that's how business works. Uh, businesses take risk and provide services, and <clears throat> as a result, they get compensated for that. That's why we're all sitting here today. So why we all have food on our table. Uh, it's because we're willing to accept a certain amount of risk. Um, governments typically aren't willing to accept risk, and if, especially if they can, can transfer it to somebody else and reward somebody for doing it, that's a touchdown Alabama. Sorry, Alabama. Sorry Auburn fans. <laughs> uh, but that's a touchdown, so, uh, in my opinion. So um, anyway, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense to to think that, oh, well, we're going to lessen the sanctions, and I say that here in just a minute, and expect people just to do the right thing just because it's the right thing. Uh, let's see here. Uh, also, it allows for redemption of property without paying for the statutory improvements first. They do have to eventually pay, but not in order to redeem. What does it say? <clears throat> the reimbursement to, to purchaser for the proposed redemptioner for allowable improvements in insurance premiums as provided in subsections B through E is not required for the proposed redeemer, redemptioner, excuse me, to take possession of the property, provided, however, that the proposed redemptioner shall reimburse the purchaser for such costs prior to January 1 of the subsequent tax year in order to complete the redemption process as provided in this subsection. Failure of the proposed redemptioner to reimburse the purchaser for such costs prior to January 1 of the subsequent tax year shall forfeit the right of the proposed redemptioner in the property. Now that sounds pretty final right there. Um, That's giving them another year. It is. It can be up to another year. That's right. Well, here's the thing. Um, okay, we don't have to, you don't have to get the verification form signed anymore by the tax sale purchaser but it doesn't provide the methodology whereby um, you notify, uh, well, in the, in the old part of the code, of this code section it does, but this new section doesn't say, oh yeah, here's how you notify the property owner of your expenses. Okay, this doesn't say that. This just says, oh yeah, by the way, if you don't pay back the, the purchaser for his expenses uh, by January 1, oh yeah, you forfeit all your rights to the property. Now, let me ask a question. Do you think that solved any problems, or do you think it created a few problems? Yes. Created a ton of problems. And who's keeping track of this? Yes, 
Yes, who's going to keep track of it, number one. Number two, uh, this should, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of lawyers that make a lot of money yeah. off this deal because it's so cloudy, it's so unclear, um, it creates, in my opinion, more problems than it solves. Um, so, uh, if you're like me and you have, you know, a group of certificates and you get a verification form, you know, every week or so, maybe every couple of weeks, and you have to, to sign it and send it back, uh, after January 1, 2020, from what I understand, that's going away. Now, again, I don't know if it's just on tax sales after 1-1-2020 or if it's going to be retroactive at all. Would a positive side of this be that if the person wants to redeem, they pay the back taxes, but they don't pay improvements, and then January 1 comes, if they don't pay the improvements, now they not only do they lose their taxes, but the person who paid it gets everything? Well, that's a great question. It's All it says is, shall forfeit the right of the proposed redemptioner in the property. That could be a lot because the proposed redemptioner uh, might be the fee simple owner of the property and they just lost all right to the property just because they didn't pay, you know, a thousand bucks in old uh, insurance premiums or didn't pay for somebody changing locks out or whatever. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Um, Without any kind of judicial act, without any, without having their day in court, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I was in the hospital. I'm a quadriplegic. Uh, you know, I couldn't do it that day. Oh, I'm sorry. You for see, there's no provision uh, that I'm aware of for extenuating circumstances to deprive. I mean, it's a it's a big deal, and. Uh, in legal circles when you deprive somebody of constitutional rights. And when I come and take your house for any reason, I'm depriving you of that house. I better have a dead gum good reason for doing it. I better have something behind my action. Otherwise, I've violated your basic constitutional rights. When you deprive somebody of property, you're depriving them of a constitutional right unless you have cause, legal cause to do that. You can't just say, Normally, you can't just come up and say, oh, yeah, you didn't. I mean, even this estate statute says, oh, yeah, you didn't uh, You didn't jump through our hoop here. Therefore, you forfeit all your right to the property. I mean, this is going to get challenged, I think, quicker than anything else. I mean, would this counteract the whole investor thing is that they could now, if they buy into it and they don't redeem, then, like, does it make it better on the investor's side in the sense that, like they don't, the redemption period is altered to where they don't have as much time or like. No, the redemption period has not changed. The only thing that's changed from what I understand is the interest rate and the requirement for repayment of cost on certificates. This is just certificates. So, um, well, it would be deeds too, but immediately it will apply to certificates. Um, so those are only two changes. Other than that, this system's still in place. Now, but you were saying that the verification of like, I guess the insurance and improvements and everything like that, so you don't have to show the verification of what you've done anymore? Like. Uh, now I'm not saying you don't have to show verif proof of what you've done. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying that um, you have to wait to get paid and you getting repaid is not, or them redeeming is not contingent upon you getting paid. In other words, they can go and redeem without paying you. That sounds like stealing to me. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a problem. And you still will get the notification that somebody's redeeming? You will when you get the check in the mail. <laughs> or when they, say, when they send you notice and say send in your certificate or whatever. I mean, that, that would be probably how they're going to notice. They're not going to... They're not going to send you a courtesy notice and say, oh, by the way, good friend, uh, we just want to let you know. Uh, no, that ain't going to happen. I, I think probably I might be wrong, but that, that probably will help people with big pockets, a corporation with big pockets, because they can buy in bulk and do very, very small improvements. 
And well, when people want to redeem nine out of ten, they're scared to go talk to a corporation because they know corporations got big work. Mm. Yeah, I, you could be right. I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of litigation over this one either way. Here are my conclusions. It deters big investors, which in my opinion was at least part of their motivation all along. That's why they lowered the interest rate. It could result in more opportunities for local investors, I should add, that are okay with 8% return. Uh, it's probably going to create an opportunity for lawyers during a lot of fees because of the improvement cost payback change. Human nature would indicate that people have to be motivated to do things that are required yet are unpleasant, like pay taxes. The way that the law compels people to comply with its requirements is by mandating sanctions for those that do not comply. Question, when you diminish those sanctions, do you think you will have more compliance or less compliance? Okay. Bull predicts, this is my bold prediction, more tax bills will go unpaid as a result of these recent acts. Gary, can you tell, like, at this point in time, uh, before the tax sales, if there's more delinquencies right now, like in Jefferson County? That's a good question. I, I'm really, I don't know yet. Um, I know that, that Jefferson usually has around 4,000. Birmingham usually has around 4,000. Uh, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Uh, Shelby, I think, Usually they have between three and four hundred. So I mean, if Shelby has eight hundred, that would be a sign, right. in my opinion. Uh, but if they have around four or five hundred, I, I don't think we can draw a conclusion at this point. But I'm, I'm going to try to be at the Shelby County sale just to observe. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will be um, just to see how it goes. But anyway, it should be interesting. How many states uh, did you say were doing this new? System. Well, I, I know Florida does it. I know Arizona does something like that where you basically bid down the interest rate. Florida is different because even if you bid down to zero um, and the people redeem within, I forget, six months, nine months, they have the person has to pay, the redeeming party has to pay a premium. It's like 500 bucks. So they got to pay 500 bucks if they redeem it in the first nine months. Um, or six months. So the investor is going to get that money. So even if you bid it down to zero, if you're the first one to zero, you still got a good chance of getting the 500 bucks. Here you got a good chance of getting zero. <laughs> you are going to get zero if you bid it down to zero. You are going to get zero interest. I mean, why? Why not put it in a savings account? It's a lot, you know, a lot less trouble and earn more money. So anyway, a lot of disincentive. Y'all, that's it. Any, any other questions? Um, Are there any other websites other than the one that you've listed that have for educational purposes like, or for continued education? Yeah. Um, the problem, there are lots of websites that talk about tax liens ta or tax sales. The problem is not many of them are state specific. A lot of them say they're state specific, but they're really not. Uh, Denise Evans' website is state specific. Uh, she's got some good information out there. She's got good tools. Of course, Tim Cheek's uh, website with a list is great. Um, I'm not aware of any others that um, my website has got some articles I've written on it. It's the websites on that card that you have in front of you uh, that talk about different things under the articles. Uh, I haven't written one recently, but I've, I wrote some a few, few years ago that are still pertinent today, dealing with different aspects of tax sales. Um, other than that, that's about all I, I know as far as resources. This is what I've seen as well as Alabama's got some weird yes. 1901 laws. Yes. A lot of other states have changed their constitution. Yes. Yes. Yes, they have. So, any more questions? Yes, ma'am. So lawyer recommendations. That's a great question. Uh, there's some lawyers that are on the REI live website um, that know how to do this stuff. I recommend checking out uh, their sponsored lawyers. So you want to throw out Chris King's information? He's one of our sponsors. Lex Christie. 
Chris King. Um, Jeff Palmer does this too, I think, doesn't he? He is one of our sponsored attorneys, but I don't think he messes with quiet title a whole lot, does he? Well, I know he does a lot of real estate stuff. He definitely um, does a lot. He does all my closings. Jeff yeah. Palmer is one. Lex Christie Law Firm is the one that does most of the quiet titles right here. Am I correct in saying that? Um, they do a lot of them. Um, That's who I personally would recommend just because they sponsor our group. Right? Yeah, I got you. I got you. Uh, let me say this. Going forward, um, first of all, I hope that we have delivered some value to you today. And um, I hope that's the case. That was my goal as I started out um, saying. And you have my, uh, uh, my card. If you have any questions, the best way to send me a question is to email it to me. I will respond to you. It might take me a day or two, but I will respond to you if you have any questions going forward. Um, does anybody have any final questions? Well, it's been a privilege to uh, speak to you today, and I appreciate your patience. And um, Brian would like to take up an offering. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, do, I do have a question. It's, I kind of know the answers to it anyway, but I want to ask you. Um, if I don't want to go, I, I listen to your class all day, Gary, and I don't necessarily want to jump through all these hoops. Do you bid on behalf of other people, other entities, things like that, for um, a small fee or something like that? Do you, do you, do you think I can do that. I do. Uh, I do some contract buying for for folks or for for other companies. Uh, I do consulting work. I do partnering on on tax deals. So those are kind of the things I do. But yeah, if you, uh, you know, if you want some coaching on it, uh, uh, some personalized coaching, I'm I'm open to to doing that or contract buying. Absolutely. Yeah. Gary, I've bought at least one, maybe just one, um, tax certificate through Gary um, because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And I wanted I wanted the help of a professional. So. Yeah. That's something you feel like this is too daunting, you don't want to try it yourself, but you still want to get into it. Yeah. Definitely get in touch with you. Absolutely. So that's it. Anybody else got anything? Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Hope y'all have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>